school kind of early. I did in, in Canada where I was at the time, you did five years of high school and I did it in four years. And my dad really, <laughs> well, it was mostly because I moved around a lot and I just, when I ended up in, in this school in Canada, I looked at my math book and the math book was virtually what I'd learned the previous year and, and then for French, so on. So I just, I was able to finish early and I was eager to get out on my own. And, um, you know, my dad wanted me to be a doctor, this kind of thing. And I said, you know what, I really, really want to be an actress. And I said, I'm young, so if I go to school and get a degree, I'll have a degree. And if I get out, I'll only be 21 when I get out. And if it doesn't work out, I can always change gears and, and so on. But, and then eventually I realized there's absolutely no other industry I could picture myself working in. So any other job would have to be something in the entertainment industry. And writing was a very big part of my career for some time, and I'm kind of getting the juice back to start doing projects again. I took a little bit of a hiatus from writing um, after having my kids, but I'm, I, I, I'm starting to feel the need to do that again. The thing is, for me with writing, I get bored for about a second. I really never get bored. The second I imagine I would be bored, I start writing. And after having kids, I never got to the point of being bored because there was always so much to do. But now, um, yeah, so writing absolutely will continue to be a part of my career. Directing, I did have work uh, for several years doing script analysis and, and kind of looking at screenplays, helping them kind of achieve what the author's going for and what, what the producer's going for and analyzing the market for, for scripts as well. So I actually could have gone into development and done sort of the drier side of it, but I, I actually stopped doing it specifically because it was taking a lot of my creative energy. I was kind of giving my best ideas to other people's scripts and I realized, you know what, I actually want to do my, my own, you know? But so I, I love acting. I'm not ready to give it up anytime soon. And I just want to actually uh, kind of expand my career a little bit more again to include writing and get back to directing as well. Um, I I never really thought about doing anything else. It's it's I wanted to act since I was five. Um, I remember seeing a play and asking my mum what they were doing, and she says, "We what? What do you mean? It was the Sound of Music." And I said, oh, "Well, I know those aren't really the children of, of Mr. Von Trapp. What what are they doing?" And she said, "It's called acting." And I said, "That's what I'm going to do, like that." And I was five, you know, and it's never it's never ever ever changed. Um, but I think if I suddenly was told one day, well, that's it, you can't do it anymore, I would also like to stay somewhere in the creative field. So um, I, I can't write, I wish I could, I'm a terrible writer. <laughs> but I would do something, uh, directing has always interested me, um, and something along the creative genes, you know, whether it's, and, and working with my hands, I love painting, I love sewing, I love um, like painting faces, makeup and stuff like that. So something like that, I guess. It's such an interesting uh, kind of thing. I mean, when, when people have asked me in the past, you know, I'm thinking about becoming a writer, I th I'm thinking about becoming an actor. I mean, really, it, it's one of those things, don't do it unless you have to do it. Because it's, I mean, I suppose it can be glamorous, and for some people, it's very, they're very lucky, and they just fall right into it, and their career just goes off on a nice, smooth trajectory. But generally speaking, you're gonna do some suffering, and you have to be, it has to be worth it to you. And I, I said to my, my family at one point when they were thinking, well, you know, do you want to do something else and think about doing something else? And I said, I would, I would much rather suffer for something that means something to me than to give it up and take what might seem like an easier life, but in fact, I wouldn't want to get out of bed in the morning. You know, it really is worth it uh, to me. And, and also it's, it's like, it's not certainly not made for everybody, but for me, even something like directing or writing, there are times where I really feel, I feel almost like I'm channeling. Like I, when I'm directing theater, for example, I feel like the most fortunate person in the world because I don't get confused. And I, there's so many things about life that are confusing, but if I have a question about a scene, I can go to bed, I have the answer in the morning. And I, I don't want to say that I'm always like, right or anything like that but it's just that feeling of really you're you're consumed by it and it's so lovely to know what you want to do it's a real privilege i feel fortunate yeah. I, I always say to people um 
acting didn't, I didn't choose it, it chose me. And if you are serious about being an actor, 90% of the time you're unemployed. 90% of the time you're being told no. And you can get down to the last two. Uh, I screen tested with a film of Johnny Depp and Marlon Brando. I didn't get it. I screen tested for Evita when Oliver Stone was going to make the film and then he pulled out and they cast Madonna. So that kind of rejection on a pretty That's constant pretty basis. Big. That's pretty yeah. big. Yeah, although I'm using those because they're very extreme. I mean, they haven't for a while, they haven't been that extreme because I don't live in LA anymore. But equally, you know, I've been up in London up against sort of top, top, top actresses and you just don't get it. And then they offer you the understudy and it's devastating. But if you can't, that is the life of an actor. But when it works, when you do get the work, when you get that, there is nothing like it in the world for me. Nothing at all. Yeah, and in fact, the job really is auditioning, generally speaking. Yeah. I mean, at a certain point, you get to the point where you don't need to audition or if the producers know you very well or that kind of thing. Yeah, not in London. In you, London you audition, audition regardless. Yeah. Uh, I can't speak for Broadway, I don't know, but certainly in London, it depends. So with musicals, they'll do, so Wicked, for example, has uh, Glinda and Alphaba, then they have what they call the standbys. So they're two girls who understudy those two characters. They come to work every day, but they never get on unless something goes wrong. And if a performer goes off, because Alphaba is such a difficult sing, girls have been known to go off halfway, uh, you know, at interval because it, act one ends with defying gravity, which is very difficult to sing. So the standby would then go on. If the standby was sick or on holiday, because you get, in a year's contract, you get holidays worked out, then the first cover would go on. But each character, each lead has three covers or three understudies. And what they do is every understudy will be in the company and they move people around. So if the first understudy goes on as one of the principals, um, they've got characters called Swings who cover all the people in the ensemble. So Swing will go on for the understudy, the understudy will go on. But it is very true, certainly in London, that you can understudy for a year and at the end of the contract, when they then go, okay, the contract's coming up, what would you like to play? And people say, well, I want to play the lead now because I've done it for a year, I've understudied, and they'll bring in fresh casting. and not it. So it's a, a difficult, um, I was an understudy, my, one of my first jobs in, in London first and only time in my life. And I was very lucky that they promoted me uh, halfway through the contract, which almost never, never, never happens. And I would love to think it was my talent, but it was luck. I was, I was the right place at the right time. They also saw, I think they looked at my CV and I didn't have a typical understudy CV, so they kind of went, okay, she can handle it. But it's, it's very hard and it's a difficult thing to it's Once you start discipline. understudying, it's very hard to break out of that, you know. It's like guest starring roles on TV. Like you keep, you know, getting cast and guest star, guest star, and then it's like how do you get that series regular role, you know? Yeah, it's a great discipline though, understudying. When I started uh, my, right out of university, I was apprenticing at the Shaw Festival, which in Canada is sort of the second largest next to Stratford. And I had to understudy the leads of three different shows. And it was really demanding, but very exciting, because I was really new to it. And on one day, I had to perform, uh, not for the audience, but for the stage managers. I had to do the three plays as the lead, and kind of one after another. And what I didn't know is that the whole company would talk about this. And I had all these people coming, clapping me on the back and buying me drinks at the end of the day because I'd done a good job. And the, one of the, the biggest show that year, um, I can't recall the name now, but it was massive. And there was one character, the, the lead female was a massive role. And it was well known that that performer was occasionally unreliable. And the understudy went on and it was, Huge. It was but exciting. She did, she did a great job. And there are those rare stories. I mean, Shirley MacLaine was made a star because she understudied somebody, and I think she was understudying Ethel Merman or somebody, and she went off at a moment's notice, and she was shoved on stage, and she was lucky. There was a New York critic in the audience. Uh, it was the opening night, and a star was born. I mean, the next day the headlines were like, and the woman was fired, and Shirley MacLaine took over. So, you know, it does happen. Anyway, 
So, any other Stargate questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually hated the flanged voice when I thought I sounded like a, you know, like a young man, like a transvestite wearing a too tight corset, and I just couldn't get that out of my head. I was like, it looks like me, but it's a man. It's so weird. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't dig it, and I unfortunately never got to use my, my real voice. So yeah, I ever. Yeah, so I had always hoped there would be a chance, but then my neck was broken and I didn't. <laughs> Pretty much the same, yeah. I was just wondering um, uh, what Ted thought would have been like a reception of character, you know, if you know, 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 you uh, throughout anyway. I did, at the audition, I did the whole audition with an American accent because I used to work half and a half in the US. So some casting directors knew I spoke like this, but other times I'd walk in and I'd be American and I'd just work as an American, you know, so. <laughs> she liked that, didn't she? Thank you. I'm here till Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. It was a little bit of a curveball having a, a girl speaking um, with a normal voice for the first time. Well, I guess. I mean, I didn't know that, you see. Yeah. So, um, I only afterwards, and then I couldn't watch the episode. I can barely look at myself in a photograph. So, for, and, and my mother always teases me and goes, well, you know, why on earth did you pick acting? Because it's a career that you spend your life looking at yourself on screen. And I literally am like this when I watch myself. <laughs> me too. Me too. I, ca I can. And the same when I hear myself. You know, and yeah, when I... Oh, yeah, I'll go to, like, not so much talking, but singing lessons. And I'll record my lesson. I'll be like, oh, I'm so proud of myself. I hit that note today. I've been struggling with that for two years. And then I'll be on the bus on the way home, and I'll listen to it. I'll be like, oh, my God. That's terrible. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I was lucky because I was able to use my own voice. And then, but I also, I was a bit, I was a bit disappointed with the flange, which sounds like a rude body part as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and in fact, I'm sure in the UK is a body part. Um, I was a bit like, I think they could have done, you know. How did you guys feel? Oh, my hello. How did you guys feel about the flange sound? I thought it was intimidating. Oh, intimidating, okay. Yeah. And alien, which I guess, guess, eh? I guess the goal would go for. Yeah. Yeah. I liked the way the men sounded when they were flanged. And for me, in fact, after I'd heard it the first time, when I came back, I seated my voice lower so that it, anticipating what they were going to do in post, so that it would just sound better to me instead of that, you know, tight <laughs> underpants, transvestite voice. <laughs> Has anyone got any more questions? Yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> I um, funny enough recently did a gig in London for the first time in about eight years um, Which was absolutely terrifying, but went very very well and something I'm looking into doing is possibly doing Some stand-up at some of the cons so because I did FedCon and was approached afterwards <laughs> I'm not that good honey. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I was approached at FedCon and they said, would you be interested in, in possibly doing like... Because uh, it's quite interesting that if people have a skill, whether they sing in a band or something, to, to kind of show that side. Um, and what I'm really working on is a set about being an actress at a con. So, watch the space. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, in Chicago, Gary Chalk, for example, is a consummate musician, and he, you guys know who Gary Chalk is, right? Have you all met him? That clown's here? Uh, no. Yeah, what's, well, his character, he was, he was a colonel, wasn't Russian. he? He was Russian. Russian yeah, yeah. So he, honestly, the second the man sees a piano, he just, like, he's, his signing table is there, but there's a piano over there, and you just see him go like this, and he'll sit down and start tinkling the ivories, you know? And then he always does a set, and just, he'll, he'll close the place down, 
And then they'll get karaoke going, and he's just fabulous, yeah. So that's a really, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I, th I mean, I'd love to do that, to have a kind of, <laughs> we can have Stargate, the musical cabaret, stand up, <laughs> one woman, <laughs> extravaganza. <laughs> I've always wanted to do a one-woman show, and it's the most terrifying prospect imaginable. And I've, I've always promised myself, eventually I'll do it, but uh, yeah, it scares the crap out of me. We could do one together, and then it wouldn't be so scary. We could do a two-one-woman show. Yeah. Two women. <laughs> two, two ladies show. Yeah. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I um, actually, because I was introduced with Cronus and you, Ron Halder and Vince Pristejo, it bugged me that Cronus was supposed to be kind of like in charge, and I was like, so I kind of wanted to be in charge, so I was glad that Nirti at least kind of, you know, stuck it to him a little bit. Um, but uh, then, honestly, when when I did Continuum, aside from the fact that it was very frustrating to, you know, walk in and stand there just while Ball, you know, lorded it all over us, I have to say I was so impressed with Cliff Simon's performance, I kind of fell in love with his character. And I kind of wanted to bump off Claudia Black so that I could <laughs> kind of take over. I thought, wouldn't Nirti have been okay in that? She could have She could have sat in that chair. <laughs> and, uh, SG1. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I actually got a bit of a, a gold god crush there. But then I got killed, so, <laughs> again. I, I would have loved to have come back, and in fact, Cliff said something yesterday, and I was gonna address it, and then, you know, the conversation went another way, but, that thing that he was talking about being the clones, that was an episode that was about Hathor. Early, early on, Michael Greenberg... Seriously? Yeah, Michael Greenberg had this idea where he said, and the, the exact analogy that he used was like a, a, a queen bee in a beehive, mm -hmm. so that she, but then we, and he's like, he wanted to do this episode with multiple versions of Hathor, so that she had all these clones that looked like her, but completely, so one from today, you know, one from another planet, but all the same. And he said, would you be up for that? And I was like, oh my God, completely up for that, because I can use all my kind of improvising skills. And what do you know? <laughs> Cliff bloody Simon. <laughs> that bloody South African. <laughs> I can only say that because I'm also a South African. So it's all right. um, but that brings up, well, we talked about it a little bit on the... Uh, one of the panels anyway, about the fact that ideas go into that writer's room and you, it's kind of like this centrifuge. You just don't know how they're gonna spin out. The ideas go in, the ones they like are kind of earmarked and then they combine them, mix them up and, and whomever whose turn it is takes and 